Hello, Nabig. Uh, I'm so sorry I couldn't be there with you this year, uh, but I appreciated the invitation so much, and I want to be there next year, hopefully as I'm riding the wave towards the nomination, uh, Democratic nomination for president. You all probably know uh, that I've qualified for the first two Democratic primary debates in June and July, which will be on NBC and CNN. So this to me is a great step forward for the basic income movement. Uh, but th there would be no movement without people like you who've been working on it for years, in some cases decades. I've learned so much from so many of you. Uh, and it's inspiring what brings you all together, uh, where you've been talking about how we can improve our societies and really advance our entire species uh, for the last number of years. And your ideas, hopefully you see, have animated me and this campaign. And the time is now. You can see there's been a, a dramatic surge in the interest in basic income and we can fight, fight, fight to make it a reality. Not in some far off future, but today in the United States of America and then from there to the rest of the world. Now I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the process of how one becomes president of the United States just because it might be of interest. Uh, so some of you aren't Americans, uh, you're uh, you know, from Canada and other countries. And the way you become president uh, is you have to win a party's nomination. The way you win a party's nomination is you go through the early states of Iowa, New Hampshire, Nevada, and South Carolina. So in Iowa, there will be about 250,000 Iowans who are caucusing. And so in order for me to be on the fast track to the White House, uh, I need to get about 50,000 Iowans who are going to caucus and be on board with universal basic income. So all of the things that you're all talking about, we can make reality if we just get 50,000 Iowans excited about basic income. And if that seems like an historic opportunity to you, that's exactly the opportunity that we have to make happen in 2020. Now, you all likely have heard about my basic income proposal, the Freedom Dividend, which would put $1,000 a month in the hands of every American adult starting at age 18. Now, uh, I decided to have it kick in at age 18 in large part because then it would go to the individual, him or herself, and not to their guardian. So you can imagine as a parent myself, if you could go to your son or daughter and say, when you turn 18, you'll receive $1,000 a month from your country because your country loves you, your country values you, and uh, we care about your future. That is a game changer. Uh, that's one of the reasons why I had it uh, kick in at 18, also from uh, various other proposals that, that had been studied who'd proposed this. And many of you might know that the plan I'm championing was originated by a guy named Andy Stern, who used to run the SEIU in the United States and was then studied by the Roosevelt Institute. So these are one of the reasons, this is one of the reasons why I made the Freedom Dividend follow these guidelines because it had already been proposed and studied. Now, uh, when you're looking to finance something like this, to me, the, the big change we have to account for is what's happening in our economy. Where Amazon, a trillion dollar tech company, paid zero in federal taxes in the United States last year despite uh, producing tens, hundreds of billions of dollars uh, in revenue, and it's absorbing another $20 billion in commerce every year, causing 30% of malls and stores to close. So how do you get the money to pay for a dividend? You have to have a mechanism where Americans benefit from all this innovation and technological progress. And the best way to do that, in my view, is a value-added tax, which is something that every other major economy has already adopted. And so with a value-added tax in the American economy, we would generate over $800 billion in new revenue uh, which combined with economic growth and cost savings and value gains from having a stronger, more educated population uh, would pay for a dividend. Now, other people are, are focused on certain other ways to try and address the fourth industrial revolution, which we're in the midst of. In my view, the reason why Donald Trump's our president today is that we'd automated away four million manufacturing jobs in the Midwest, and we're about to do the same to millions of retail jobs, call center jobs, fast food jobs, truck driving jobs, and on and on. Now, some people are championing uh, a jobs guarantee, and there are certainly elements of that that would be welcome. For example, a, a, a dramatic investment in infrastructure would create hundreds of thousands of, uh, of jobs here in the States, and it would uh, create immense value and address our crumbling streets and bridges. But if you were to say that the federal government should employ everyone, then that would wind up creating many, many difficult situations where people didn't want to do a job or didn't get along with uh, their supervisor or um, you know, uh, the, their job 
uh, wasn't a good fit for whatever reason, but they were dependent on that job to meet their basic needs. And you'd have to create an immense new structure to be able to employ and monitor all these people that you, the government was now employing. So while government jobs should be a piece of the puzzle, we should not be turning to that as our primary recourse in a time of automation. Uh, the last question you wanted me to address was whether the freedom dividend would complement, replace, uh, or have a mixed relationship with the existing welfare state. And to me, uh, the goal is to provide something that people would prefer to the existing welfare state, but not take anything away from uh, folks who need those benefits in order to meet their needs. And so uh, it, while it would be universal, it would be opt-in, and if you opt-in, then you would forego benefits from certain uh, cash and cash-like programs in the US. But we would be more than doubling the amount of money that's going to citizens uh, and dramatically improve people's health, mental health, uh, and ability to control their own futures. So if you want to make this happen, again, you're all coming together, you're passionate about trying to advance basic income. Um, we don't have to talk to each other anymore. We can talk to our entire country and the entire world. And that's what's happening with my campaign right now. Uh, I am now in CNN's top 10. I'm one of only 11 candidates who is qualified for the Democratic primary debates. Raised over $3 million in increments of only $19 each. Uh, and so people have looked at my polling numbers, which are between 2 and 3% in different states. To use Iowa as an example, I'm at 2% in Iowa, and only 5% of Iowans say they've heard a lot about me. So that's a tremendous ratio, and it shows that we can grow and grow. Now, you all have been studying this for years, and I hope that you're thrilled by the prospect of actually getting this front and center on the debate stage into the White House and past the threshold. We do not have unlimited time. Uh, our economy is transforming very quickly. The robot trucks are going to be on the highways in five to 10 years. Uh, and so the country and the world needs us to succeed. So I hope you'll join me in this. I hope you are thrilled at the prospect of, of the ideas that you've been studying for years, making it into the mainstream, and then transforming our societies for the better. And congratulations on all you do. Again, I've learned so much from all of you at NABIG. And hopefully, this time next year, when you're in the States and having your giant gathering, I will be there in person, and we will be high-fiving the fact that universal basic income is on the cusp of becoming law. Thank you so much. Have a great time today.